Modern Warfare 2 is out now, and there's a lot to adjust when you first jump in, or perhaps even when you're already established. And today, we're running down the best game-changing settings and how they can help your overall experience greatly. From visibility, feel, and even some performance-enhancing settings overall, this is our annual guide for the best settings that you should be using. As we go along, drop your thoughts below how you enjoy the game. If you enjoyed the video, you'll find it at all insightful. Do me a favor and drop a like on it. And if you're new to the channel, make sure you subscribe to stay updated with all things Modern Warfare 2. We're just getting started here. There's so much to keep you in the loop on here now that the game has launched. Yesterday, we hit half a million subscribers and truly i cannot thank you guys enough for the absolutely explosive support as of lately you guys are absolute legends if you'd like to join us on that journey towards 600,000 and beyond i'd love to have you in the community additionally we'll be live on twitch most of the day again drops should be enabled here if you want to chill and grab some rewards links in the description below and finally my friends at gamer advantage have a really awesome promo going on if you use code espresso on any pair of blue light glasses from now until the 30th you get a 50 dollars gift card for their store best glasses on the market to invest in your vision health and free cash back that's a win link below if you guys are interested but that said let's talk about these settings. Let's start out with your general settings, things that you can use on either PC or console. For your quick settings, this is all preference-based, I think. Button layout, I usually do tactical, though one really cool thing about this year is that for once, you have the ability to customize your own button layout if you'd prefer, allowing you full freedom of choice on where to bind your buttons, which is normally only reserved for things like keyboard and mouse, so pretty cool to see. I'm probably going to stick with tactical just because I'm so used to it, but it's awesome for anyone that wants to experiment with these things. Sensitivity, again, all preference-based. I've played on 9.9 since the scale of 20 was introduced a few years back, but it's really all what feels good to you, what feels like you can snap to an enemy without overshooting. Part of that comes down to aim assist and response curves, but we'll get there in a second, though they won't completely dictate your choice on sensitivity and what you should be using. The best thing I'd say if you're trying to find what is perfect for you is to go into private match, set up a game with bots, and just play around with different sensitivities, try and snap to enemies, see what feels fast, too slow, or just perfect. It's all trial and error at that point. For controller settings, again, inputs come down to preference. Do you want vibration on, off, trigger effects? This one you may not need. I'd turn them off. And honestly, some people might not even experience this to begin with. For example, I play on a scuff controller with digital tap triggers. So it's like a mouse click instead of resistance and such. So while even on, I wouldn't notice it. For those on PlayStation 4, 5, and Xbox, you'll notice these settings a bit more. But again, while it is preference-based, I'd still suggest turning this off. It'll allow for more spammy functions like trigger finger fire rate on semi-autos and such. It's a cool feature, but it's just not something that will aid you in a competitive manner. Sensitivity multipliers, again, subjective. They can help, but may throw you off. Again, preference-based, try out some gameplay with that. Maybe in private matches once again. Your gameplay settings, there's a few things that I would definitely recommend. Automatic sprints. I like to be in the action. I'm almost always going to opt for auto tax sprint so that it's always active when it can be, and so I'm not destroying my thumbsticks trying to double tap to enable it on the fly. But again, preference-based still. Weapon mount activation. For me, it's always been ADS plus melee is my preferred. ADS is a way that you could have enabled a form of slide canceling in the beta, so people were choosing this earlier on, but truthfully, that was way too intrusive on the regular gameplay experience, if you ask me. You just get close to a wall and then you snap onto it, which you might not want to do. Now, as for your interact and reload behavior, I'd recommend either tap to reload or prioritize reload. Personally, for me, it's prioritize reload. I'd recommend these for MP. Warzone and DMZ might be a different story with the looting aspect of things here, but reloading is, to me, by far the more important of the two functions in 6v6 and Ground War. You won't want to be in a gunfight and accidentally pick up somebody's weapon by simply tapping square, X, or whatever you have bound on PC. Now, beyond that, let's jump over to the advanced tab, because this is where the fun begins, where it gets a little bit more important. Naturally, if you're on controller, you're going to want to have aim assist turned on. Aim assist type is more preference based. I stick with default. The other three options have different aim slowdowns, which basically means that if you try and scroll past an enemy, it'll have different windows and speeds at which they slow down when actually scrolling over top of that enemy in your viewpoint. Default just always feels the most natural to me. Again, preference based though. But what is important is aim response curve type. This I highly, highly, highly recommend dynamic. Yes, you can play with standard, you can play with linear, but this is just the way that your aim will interact with your movement on your right thumbstick. Dynamic is a great choice for smooth and snappy aiming. It's reverse S-curve, giving you a bit more control and fine precision on that as opposed to something like standard. You kind of have to give it a push before it will recognize that input a little further. Linear, if you push a little too hard, you could overshoot an enemy and things like that. So for me, it's always been dynamic. And from a competitive standpoint, most of the pros do use dynamic as well. So it'll give you that nice little edge here. ADS sensitivity multiplier again that's preference based as is your custom zoom sensitivity you might want to play around with your dead zones this is something that if you have any stick drift on your controllers that is something that can help mitigate that so that you're not setting your 
controller down, your hands off, but your viewpoint is changing or you might be walking. Rule of thumb, the closer the value is to zero, it will not add any sort of artificial resistance. If you just simply tap your thumbstick, it will take that as input, but the higher to one you go, the more, again, artificial resistance, we can call it perhaps, it'll add to that movement. Now for your L2 and R2 or left and right trigger dead zones, I'd put those down to zero just so that you can end up having immediate feedback in those. That's really good for your gameplay engagement. Beyond that, getting into some movement behaviors, a lot of this becomes preference based. Auto move forward, I'd say to turn that off. Tax sprint behavior, this is something that you have to keep in mind. What you have that automatic sprint set to, because mine's auto tax sprint, I don't really ever change it too much. The double tap to sprint is overridden by that. The one thing that I would definitely say to turn off though is grounded mantle. While it might be nice to in combat mantle something as you're just running towards it and you hit your A, X or whatever you have bound, maybe space bar on keyboard. This a lot of the times is something that if you're on a rooftop or something like that, you try and mantle up on top of the edge, it'll mantle you over. So that's something to bear in mind that this is just something that I think having that ability to control it yourself just a little further is definitely nice. The automatic airborne mantle, I just keep on partial. Personally, I'd turn off the parachute auto deploy. Just like in Warzone, it is something that you can control it and you can get a little bit closer to the ground if you turn it off as opposed to whenever it deploys automatically for you. There's that little awkward period where you're just floating above the ground if you have it on where you're entirely vulnerable. I have died so many times, even just with this launch already in that small window. So I'd recommend turning it off. Beyond that, combat behaviors, I'd say the weapon mount activation delay, put that to short, allow for the quick C4 detonation, turn that on so that you can end up blowing that up almost as soon as you end up throwing it. And the rest in the advanced tab is all preference based. Now, before we jump on over to the graphic settings, a quick mention, check out my friends over at Gamer Advantage. If you guys have been around the channel, you guys know that I've been talking about them for a year and a half now at this point, and I still swear by them. If you work at a PC, look at a screen for any kind of prolonged periods of time a day, just like your phone, or you work at a desk at an office, you may already know the effects of blue light. Personally, I've had trouble combating it for years. This whole YouTuber creator life isn't as glamorous as vloggers and all those big guys make it out to be. We're not partying 24 seven, especially here in launch. I'm grinding and sitting at my desk 12, 14 hours a day, grinding out the game and also creating the content here with you. So over the years, it's worn on me, but Gamer Advantage is absolutely the advantage of me. Espresso, head and shoulders, better than any generic pair of blue light glasses you'll find on Amazon. They're comfortable, durable, and lightweight frames make them a great choice for all day use and their lenses are clinically proven. So I've sworn by these guys for a long, time. Now, they do the technical breakdowns way better than I ever could. If you guys want to check them out, learn more, link in the description below. But if you guys want to pick something up, invest in your long-term vision health, using code ESPRESSO not only gives you a 10% discount at checkout, but for, again, a limited time from now until the 30th, you get a $50 gift card to use on their site as well. So essentially free cash back just for simply picking up a pair of glasses. If you guys are at all interested, again, link in the description below. Go check them out, though. Love those guys. That said, let's talk about these graphic settings. This is going to be something that is important, though, in this section, we're going to be combining both PC and the console display settings with PC stuff actually potentially even improving your performance, adding frames to your experience overall. First and foremost, if you are on PC, you have the option to go full screen exclusive. Highly recommend that. Your screen refresh rate, whatever your monitor ends up having. The display resolution, again, whatever your monitor allows. Aspect ratio, entirely subjective. If you want to play stretched, if you want to play narrow, if you want to play standard 16 by 9, it's all entirely up to you. For PC players, VSync is an option here. It can prevent some screen tearing, but it will lock to your monitor's refresh rate. So it might limit you in some capacity. It might not. That's again, trial by error, subjective and preference based. Going to the quality tab here with this, one of the biggest things on PC that I can recommend here is the upscaling and sharpening settings available on offer. For this, it's something that you might not see NVIDIA DLSS right away, but that is absolutely what I would highly recommend here with this. This is something that I think is defaulted to Fidelity FX Cast, which is also on the console versions here of this. But if you have an NVIDIA graphics card, NVIDIA DLSS works directly with that to prioritize and further optimize the experience overall. Now, admittedly, the DLSS preset really comes down to what quality you're playing at. A lot of this optimization here is for 2K and above, so 1440p, 4K, and sometimes even upwards as of 8K can be beneficial as well. And unfortunately, the presets don't really give a whole ton in terms of description for what they do. Prior games, quality actually would refer to offers a high image quality and that it's beneficial for 2K. Same thing with balanced around that point. Performance and above is usually where you end up getting into that 4K range and ultra performance, while again, very minimal in terms of usage overall, might be something that is a little bit more prioritized towards 8K as well, but still offering more performance for 4K users on top of all of that. They're kind of scaled in that regard where one's a little bit better than the next, 
then other ones better than that one, and another one's better than that one. But if you're playing at 1440p, 2K, I'd recommend quality or balanced 4K or above performance and ultra performance. Your video memory scale, that's going to be dependent upon what you have available in your system. Your VRAM usage is entirely dependent on what your system has and the GPU you have on hand as well. And as for the details and textures, this is entirely subjective. Again, really coming down to your system, what it can handle. So things like your texture resolution, that is going to have a high effect on your VRAM usage, where if you drop that from, say, high to low, you save over two gigabytes in VRAM usage. So it's entirely dependent on what you want. If you want your game to look great or if you want a competitive edge, if you're looking to gain a few frames per setting, look for things that have medium impact on your VRAM and or GPU. Naturally, the more strain you have on it, the less frames you'll end up getting. In regards to other things that NVIDIA settings can help boost is the NVIDIA Reflex low latency. This I'd recommend on or on plus boost here to allow for a little bit more optimization for your system latency. You may actually feel that in game. So definitely end up throwing that on or again on plus boost depending on your card. And then we get down to things that you can see also on console. Things like your depth of field, world motion blur, weapon motion blur, film grain. The depth the field, I think, is entirely preference-based. It adds a little bit of blur to your peripherals whenever you're aimed down sight. It's entirely subjective. It doesn't necessarily do anything. It doesn't really do anything for you in a competitive fashion, but it is something that also isn't the worst thing to keep on, or if you forget to turn it off, it's not really going to hurt you too bad. World blur and weapon motion blur, turn those off. While they want to create this sort of cinematic experience with this from a competitive standpoint, if you end up swiping across your screen, looking right or left or vice versa, you're going to end up missing enemies that could be off in the distance because of that motion blur. With it off, you can see those character models way more clearly, so I highly recommend turning those off. And film grain, while it is preference-based, while it is subjective, I definitely turn it off as well. It creates this sort of noise effect on your graphics and what it looks like. To me, it just doesn't look all that great. Again, trying to go a bit more filmic with it, a bit more of a cinematic experience rather than what you just want to see of the enemies of the gameplay experience. Then we can move on over into the view category. This is something that for the first time on consoles in the Modern Warfare franchise, yes, Cold War Vanguard had FOV, but for the first time in a Modern Warfare game, you now have the ability to change your FOV. This is entirely preference based. For me, the sweet spot was usually right around 106. I jumped up to 120 at some point and then I was just like, well, I can't go back now. I'm so used to 120, but it is something that's entirely preference based. How much you see more of your peripherals rather than just that locked on console ADFOV. So definitely check this out. Again, go into private matches, test it out what you think is the best, what feels more natural to you, because the more that you end up going, the higher you go in that number, the more sort of fishbowl approach it has. It's got that fisheye lens almost because you see more of the world around you. The one thing that I absolutely will recommend though is to change your ADS field of view if it is not defaulted to it already. This make it affected. Independent is something that whenever you change your FOV, it'll still scale back when you ADS to that 80 FOV. Affected means that it will scale with that change in that FOV as well, so that if you, for whatever reason, go down to, say, 60 FOV, it'll make it tighter when you ADS, but if you go all the way up to 120, it doesn't necessarily zoom you back into that 80 FOV viewpoint, and it allows you to see more of your peripheral still while ADS. So, highly recommend Affected. It will definitely feel way more natural once you get the feel of it as well, so try that out. Make sure you have that on. Weapon field of view. I want to say it was wide. They can offer a little bit more in terms of view around you simply because it makes your weapon look smaller, but it's a minimal difference. The third person FOV, that really comes down to if you're playing third person a ton. Personally, I don't really touch this. I don't touch third person all that much at all, but if you want the higher FOV, increase it. The only other thing that I think can really be beneficial here is that you can change your default spectator camera from either the in-game view or the helmet camera. In the beta, and even right now, it was defaulted to the helmet cam. I don't think there was the option though in the beta to turn this off, but it was a new cool perspective perspective, but some people didn't like it. If you want to change back to just that first person view when you're spectating someone, just change that back to the game perspective. Audio settings, a lot of this is preference based. For me personally, home theater is that mix that I think works the best with my headphones, but it really depends on what you're playing the game with. If you're playing out of TV speakers, home theater might not be your best bet. That might be something like your sound bar. If you're playing with studio quality headphones, that could be an entirely different mix setting than what you have if you just have, say, your earbuds that you pop in. The EQ and the mix on those are entirely different fundamentally, so it's something that, again, is entirely preference-based. Play around and experiment with those, see what kind of bass settings you can get out of it, see if you can differentiate footsteps, gunfire audio, if it's too sharp, too high, entirely preference-based. Master
Master volume, keep that wherever you want. Music volume, you can drop all the way down to zero. That is the least consequential thing here in regards to the audio settings. The OST is awesome, but it really doesn't help you in a gameplay. And sometimes, even in things like Warzone, that audio can actually come in at terrible times. I know that one of the big things when Warzone first launched was that the music for the end game sequence was way too loud. You couldn't hear any footsteps if they were around you, so it almost got you killed sometimes more than it helped. So music volume, unless you're jamming out, drop that down to zero to 50 if you want to. The effects volume, that's going to be things like your footsteps and everything that helps you out in that regard. Hit marker volume, you can drop that down if you'd like. If not, totally cool. Dialogue volume, I'd keep that up just because sometimes your operator will give callouts that can be beneficial. Subtitles, preference-based. Voice chat, again, preference-based. And then your advanced audio settings, juggernaut music, that's something you can turn on or off. The hit marker sounds you can change as well. And one cool thing that they did add this year is the setting to reduce tinnitus sound, meaning that whenever you get stunned or flashed, it is something that replaces that audio with a less harsh hissing sound. So definitely nice that that's taken into consideration, but might not be something that is necessarily for you. Finally, the last thing we'll talk about is the interface. This, there's more stuff on PC than there is on console. One thing that I always like to have is the FPS counter up whenever I'm on PC. One really big thing to have is server latency. Those all coming in your telemetry settings. Other big things to take into consideration is the minimap shape. As always, I'd recommend square simply because it gives you about like 30% more area in what you see on that minimap as opposed to circular. Minimap rotation, I would turn on so that everything that you see is right in front of you is always true north on that minimap rotation. And also, it allows you to get a better understanding at a quick glance on where enemies will be coming versus where you are looking. If you don't have rotation on, you see, say, an empty spot in the north of the minimap, but you're looking south, you might not necessarily notice that immediately, that your triangle is looking down rather than up. So having that on is just something that helps me out and I think will help you out as well. Crosshairs, have those on. Don't know why you would turn those off. Hit marker visuals, that's subjective. I like having them on, being able to see when my shots land. So I'd highly recommend. I would keep player names at full. The only thing that is unfortunate is that this year, we don't have that option for the enemies. It's just a diamond above the enemies' heads, but your teammates still have those names. On one hand, it might be nice to see your teammates with their names fully above their head, but at the same time, if it gets too in the way of what you see against an enemy, like your teammate's name shows up above an enemy's head, you can turn that perhaps off down to just the icon only. It's subjective, preference-based. And that, for the most part, will conclude the settings here for Modern Warfare 2. A lot of stuff up on deck this year, a lot of things you can play around with, again, both on PC and on console. So some cool stuff to take advantage of and some stuff that I think can really help you out in general for visibility, feel, and even some performance, again, increasing that FPS on PC. So that's where we're gonna call it. That's where we're gonna wrap it up. Love to get your thoughts and feedback down there in the comment section down below. How are you guys feeling about the game in terms of the performance and the setting? I've seen a lot of crashing, but beyond that, feels pretty smooth on PC. Happy with that, but love to get your feedback. If you enjoyed the video, do me a favor and drop a like on it. And if you're new to the channel, make sure you guys subscribe so you don't miss a single thing. We're getting all things Modern Warfare 2. We have so much up on deck. We're only just getting started. So if you're new, I'd love to have you in the community. For now, though, thanks so much for watching. My name is Espresso. I'll see you guys later. Take care and peace.